Hey everyone, Truth Surge here again, and welcome to another mind-boggling episode of Jesus, Hebrew Human, or Mythical Messiah. The exceptions, or the contradictions, or the objections, or the verses that make us go, hmm. And uh, so, it's been a while, but in the uh, most recent episodes, we've looked at some of the verses that seem to contradict the Jesus myth theory. And um, what we're going to do uh, this time is going to be pretty much the same. We're going to take a look at some verses that, uh, at face value, don't bode very well for the Jesus myth theory. And in particular, we're going to look at the verses where Paul refers to Jesus as a man, or in the Greek, anthropos. And um, so uh, we're going to take a look at those and see if we can't dissect it and... um, dig around and excavate some, uh, some things that might help shed some light on what uh, is going on. How could Paul refer to Jesus as a man if Paul knew that Jesus had never been on earth? So it leaves us, uh, it gives us a little work to do. So uh, we're going to be looking at that. And um, this one is not so cut and dried as a lot of the other ones, but I think I've got a reasonable explanation. Uh, At least to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. So we'll find out, I suppose. So anyway, let's quit talking about it and actually look at it. So go grab your shovel and I'll get my shovel and let's do a little digging and see if we can't excavate some arguments to explain why Paul might refer to Jesus as Anthropos. In both Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome and his first letter to the believers at Corinth, Paul refers to Jesus as a man, or in the original Greek as anthropos. This Greek word is the equivalent of human being. Let's look at the passages and see if we can make some sense of this apparent anomaly. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. First, we could ask if these have been mistranslated. There can be no mistake about the meaning of anthropos. It means human being and is used almost 600 times in the New Testament to mean precisely that. So we can be sure that the word man in these three verses is an adequate translation into English from the ancient Greek. A comparison of some major translations using Romans 5.15 will confirm this. This is true for the two passages in 1 Corinthians also. Another possible explanation we could explore is to ask, could these be a later edit or insertion by a more orthodox Christian? I don't think so. They don't have the earmarks of an insertion or edit. There is no obvious break in the flow of thought. There are no anachronisms present. And the word anthropos is present in the 3rd century Codex Sinaiticus as well as P46 for the two verses in 1 Corinthians 15. P46 is a manuscript dated to around the year 200 CE. Romans 5.15 did not survive in P46. Therefore, we must abandon the idea of a later edit and seek elsewhere for a logical explanation. Although I might note before moving on that there is an insertion in 1 Corinthians 15.47, as some manuscripts, including Codex Sinaiticus, do not contain the word Lord, but this neither helps nor harms the case at this point. It makes sense that if Paul does not intend for us to understand Jesus as being truly human in every way, then Paul must have some other intention or reason for calling Jesus Anthropos in these two passages. There are several pieces to the solution, but The primary clue is the fact that in both passages, Paul is comparing Jesus to Adam. Nowhere else in the New Testament is Jesus compared to Adam. And nowhere else in the New Testament 
is Jesus referred to as Anthropos. Only in these two passages where Paul compares Jesus to Adam, Adam being the Hebrew word for man, is Jesus called Anthropos. I think Paul's goal was to show Jesus as a kind of Adam, a special individual who is a sort of counterpart to Adam, a sort of bookend to complete God's dealings with mankind and set the upper boundary of history with the impending appearance of his son on earth. Adam was the first man, and Jesus is the second man, or last, depending on which verse you want to go with. To create this bookend construct, Paul needs to fudge the facts a bit and call Jesus a man, even though Jesus only took on the shape of a man, as we learn from Paul himself in Philippians 2, 7 through 8, as well as Romans 8, 3. See Jesus, Hebrew human or mythical Messiah 6a through 6g. Since Paul's Jesus became like a man in appearance only, when he descended through heaven to be killed by the demons in the lowest level of heaven, Paul can refer to Jesus as a man when comparing him to Adam in order to complete his comparison and maintain the symmetry between Adam and Jesus. Paul is using anthropos loosely, not literally. It is crucial to note again that nowhere else in the New Testament outside the Gospels and Acts is Jesus referred to as Anthropos, except in these two passages where Paul is comparing him to Adam, and nowhere else is Jesus compared to Adam in the entire New Testament, except for these two passages. Paul wants to maintain the symmetry in his comparison contrast in order to strengthen his argument. It's a literary construct used frequently among the ancient Greek writers. To drive home the point, let me show you this technique by both Paul and the author of Hebrews. First, we'll examine it in Hebrews. The author of Hebrews uses the technique of comparing and contrasting in a dualistic nature, just as Paul is doing in the two passages in question. Just as Paul's goal is to compare and contrast Jesus with Adam, showing Jesus to be superior. The author of Hebrews' goal is to compare and contrast Jesus with the earthly high priests, showing how Jesus is superior to them. In order to do this, the author spotlights the similarities while also highlighting the superior nature of Jesus' sacrifice. The more parallels that can be drawn, the stronger the argument is made. Let's now look at how this comparison-contrast technique works. We'll show the earthly high priest at the bottom of the screen and Jesus at the top. This will help drive home the separation that the author is maintaining between the earthly high priest and the heavenly high priest. The earthly high priests offered their sacrifices in earthly tabernacles made by human hands. Jesus, however, offered his sacrifice in the heavenly tabernacle, not made by human hands. Notice there is a similarity, both offered sacrifices, and a difference. Jesus' sacrifice was offered in a perfect tabernacle, in heaven, not on earth. The earthly high priests offered blood, not their own. Jesus, however, offered his own blood. Again, the parallel and the contrast. By the way, if Jesus offered himself in heaven, the blood mentioned here would obviously not be human blood, but would be perhaps similar to the same type of blood that the Greek gods possessed, the same type of physical substance that all the gods of myth possessed, not human flesh, but flesh nonetheless. The earthly high priest offered sacrifices often. Jesus, however, offered himself once. Now let's take a look at how the author of Hebrews is twisting the facts just a little bit in order to create his comparison contrast, and even call Jesus a high priest. The subtle difference here is that Jesus is made to be a priest who offered himself of his own accord. The author is twisting the truth just a tad in order to maintain his parallel, just as Paul is stretching the truth about Jesus being a human being. Jesus did not offer himself. God delivered Jesus up to be killed. God handed over his son to be killed. It was God who offered the sacrifice of his son. 